Hello, everyone. It is almost just about 3 p.m. here, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the ARPA-E Repair Program Briefing Webinar. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions you might have during the webinar via the chat function on the control panel, which should be on the right side of your screen, or you can uh, use the raise hand function during the webinar. Um, we can unmute you during the uh, question, and, question and answer period at the end of our presentations. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Berman for some uh, opening remarks and to introduce our panel. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. I think this is going to be a really great webinar and I'm so excited to um, be starting us off here. This is a collaborative between uh, NARUC and DOE in the Natural Gas Partnership. This partnership was a result of its predecessor, the Natural Gas Infrastructure Modernization Partnership, which was established in 2016. This partnership seeks to convene state regulators, federal agencies, other stakeholders to discuss natural gas pipeline leak detection and measurement tools, to look at exploring new technologies and cost-effective practices that will help with enhancing pipeline safety, efficiency, and deliverability. Um, it really is, for us, really important that we engage in these partnerships to enable information sharing about these emerging technologies technologies and examine critical issues around the transportation and consumption of natural gas that can improve safety, reliability, resiliency, affordability, and continued environmental stewardship of our natural gas infrastructure. I am so excited today to have with us my co-vice chairs of uh, the Committee on Gas, yeah, Julie Fedorchik from North Dakota and Ethan Kimbrell from Illinois. I'm gonna turn it over to them. Uh, I look forward to being a part of this, substantively listening and engaging, and um, hope that you um, enjoy it as much as I'm sure uh, we all will. Thank you. Ethan and Julie. Uh, it is my understanding that Commissioner Fedorchuk has uh, audio issues, so uh, if can, you can go ahead. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Glad you could join us um, for this program today. Um, it's of special interest to me because here in Illinois, we have People's Gas uh, Systems Modernization Program, which is uh, not due to be complete for another 20 years. So. The interest in this uh, technology and the speed at which um, they'll be able to um, repair these pipes is is significant. So it's not lost on on me for sure. I I guess I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker of our first uh, panelist today, Dr. Jack Leonard, who is the program director at the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy. Um, his focus there is on methane production, distribution, and use. Uh, prior to his work there, he was at the Chesapeake Utilities Corporation where he served as Vice President of Business Development. And before that, he served as Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at the Gas Technology Institute where he led the Office of Technology and Innovation. Uh, he earned his B.S. in chemical engineering from the University of Cincinnati and a Ph.D. in chemical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, so without further ado. Well, before, we have, before we have Jack speak, I think what Julie has um, corrected her audio issues. So Julie, before oh. we have Jack speak, maybe Julie, you want to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Diane. Uh, sorry about that. I don't know. We had checked everything and then all of a sudden my audio went away and I couldn't hear anybody, so sorry about that. I uh, appreciate uh, Diane and Andreas's work to get this uh, panel started and everyone at NARUC. This is a great opportunity for um, commissioners and others to learn more about this program. Um, Jack is gonna tell us about that. 
there are some really exciting things happening um, in terms of research to help make the most of the infrastructure that already exists in the ground. We all know as, as regulators on the phone how hard it is to permit new infrastructure. And so that um, makes it really, really important to extend the life of the existing infrastructure and keep it as safe as possible. And, and that's really what all of these um, various research programs are aimed at doing. Uh, and so I'm excited to learn more about them and learn how they might be applied in, in my state, as I hope all of you are too, and we look forward to having a good discussion of this stuff today. Thank you. Back to you, Ethan. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Leonard, you could uh, get us started. Okay, well, thank you. And let me start by saying, you know, how much I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you know, Commissioner Berman mentioned that, you know, this group is part of a uh, uh, an outreach between the Department of Energy and the, and the gas utility NARU, uh, uh members. And I, I want to emphasize that there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you. In fact, we're going to actually solicit your active involvement in this program, plenty of opportunities for you to participate. So the, the program is, you know, uh, somewhat euphemistically called repair. But I want to emphasize that the objective of this program is not just to repair pipes, but to restore them to a functionality where they would be as good or better than new pipes. And let's jump into the program and talk a little bit first, though, about ARPA-E, just to orient everyone. If we could have the next slide, please. So ARPA-E is a relatively small group within the Department of Energy. We were formed about 10 years ago with a specific function. At the time, there was a, a need that was recognized for the U.S. government to foster potentially very, very impactful programs that were just perceived as too risky for the private sector. So there were, there were a lot of good ideas that weren't getting to see the light of day um, because there was no one willing to step up and take the risk. And uh, through a series of reports and then uh, acts of Congress, RPE was put together about 10 years ago. And, uh, and so we've been executing our mission where we go in, and if we can look at the next slide, please, um, our mission is tied to uh, providing funding, research and development funding, for what we consider to be transformational ideas. Um, and our, our budgets have been increasing every year. Congress seems to like us. Um, and uh, and uh, so, so we, uh, we actually have a fairly robust budget. And our, our challenge is to find really interesting programs and link those with the end users. And, and that's part of the outreach that we're doing today. Um, the, uh, the end goal for RPE, if we go to the next slide, is, is to actually commercialize products. Um, we, we try and work in three areas, you know, reduce imports or improve our energy use efficiency, uh, also reduce emissions. But the end goal of RPE is not to compete with, say, the National Science Foundation. It's, it's not to create new knowledge. It's to create new products and services that give the U.S. energy industry an advantage. And so if we look at the next slide, the way we judge ourselves, the metrics we use to judge ourselves is partially how many projects have we put out there. And we've, we've funded about 950 projects at this stage of our last 10 years. But we also look at how much investment those follow-on projects have received after RPE. And you can see that, that you know, we actually have a pretty good track record where the, the, if you will, the alumni of RPE wind up going out into the private sector and they're able to raise funds based on the ability to leverage the RPE funds, which allowed them to de-risk their technology. We formed uh, close to 100 companies at this stage and, you know, hundreds of patents. But again, our objective is to get technologies into the marketplace. And as we'll be talking in a few minutes, NARU has a key issue to play in enabling that for the repair program. Um, and just to give you a visual on the next slide of where RPE plays, you know, there's existing technologies which have incremental improvements. But there's a recognition that many times there's new ideas that could be radically, radically disruptive but generally in the early stages, they're very expensive. And so, for example, if you think about wind energy, 
those of us who remember back in the 1970s when wind energy was first being developed, or even worse, TV cells, you know, those things could only be afforded. You know, the only people who could afford those were, were NASA. You know, the cost was just so high. But if you look at a disruptive technology like that today, decades later, it now rivals, you know, some of the most efficient uh, efficient fossil fuel generators in terms of life cycle costs. So we're trying to do the same thing with natural gas infrastructure. You know, I think we all recognize that when people go in to repair pipes, the pipe is almost the least significant part of the cost component. It's all about the excavation. And so when we go to the next slide, the whole purpose of the repair program is to avoid excavation. So there's really two pieces to the repair program. The first is to rehabilitate cast iron and bare steel pipes. And we're starting just because we needed to pick a starting place. We're going to look at 10 inch diameter pipes and larger. And our goal is to ensure that these pipes now have a 50 year life. Essentially the equivalent life is if we had re retrofitted them with, uh, with brand new HDPE. Our cost targets a million dollars a mile. And I think a lot of the commissioners will have seen these uh, you know, pipe replacement programs in the urban areas. We're looking at three to even as high as $10 million a mile. But, but in principle, our cost should be independent of whether you're in an urban zone or a rural zone because it's a, we're using robotic tools to go in and fix the pipes from the inside. So the surface activities uh, should not be impacting the cost. One of the key issues though, is we need to make sure that what we do here is accepted by regulators. So that's FEMSA and the state regulators as equal to pipeline replacement. So we wanna make sure from the very beginning that we're on track with making sure the regulatory issues are being addressed. Any regulatory concerns, questions, et cetera, are being addressed through the program. The last thing we wanna do is spend three years and $38 million and come back and present a bunch of results and have regulators say, oh, we wish you would have explored X, Y, or Z, or we have questions about A, B, and C. Our goal is to get it right the first time by actively engaging you know, this stakeholder group and the FEMS of people uh, from the very beginning. Um, a second piece of this, since we're gonna be working all around the pipes and inside the pipes, is to go ahead and take advantage of that and create 3D maps of the pipes as well as other underground infrastructure. And I'll be talking briefly um, about uh, the approaches we're using there. But what we wanna have at the end of the day is not just 3D maps, but 3D maps that also integrate all the information from the repair techniques, material certifications, how the repair tools are being run. And as part of this repair program, we're not looking at just developing coatings and robots to deposit those coatings. We're also looking to develop inline inspection tools to validate that the repairs are adequate. So we have an opportunity now to integrate that inspection data as part of the 3D maps. So again, I said it was a three year, $38.5 million budget, and we're going after the legacy pipes, and there's still, as you know, about all order of magnitude, maybe uh, about uh, 60,000 miles of those pipes out there. Um, next slide, I'd like to talk a little bit about the benefits. First of all, it's minimizing the excavation. You know, talking to some of the people in California, I think they were approaching $10 million a mile. I can tell you the pipe was in the single digit percentage of the total cost there. It's really about avoiding that excavation that you see in the pictures there on the right. Um, but we also think there's an opportunity to enhance the assets. So we mentioned that we're looking for a 50 year life, but as part of this, and you'll hear from some of the performers, we're also looking for smarter pipes pipes that have self-healing or self-reporting functionality built into them. We want a better pipe than what you get with polyethylene. And with the 3D mapping, we should be able to have better tracking, better traceability, uh, better inspection records. And I want to point out that this same technology that we're working on for natural gas distribution pipes has fits elsewhere. So for example, in the water sector, uh, we're, you know, we're looking at roughly in the gas distribution world, 20, 30,000 miles of cast iron pipes. They have 500,000 miles of cast iron pipes. Um, fortunately, nobody dies when water pipes leak, but the cost to replace that infrastructure is exorbitant. And it's a similar situation for the sewer companies. 
And we're hoping that the technologies we develop here can be used broadly across all these other infrastructure areas because one, that helps pull companies in to provide this service. And two, it helps us build the knowledge base and drive the cost down through experience. Um, you know, if you look across the, the U.S., we're talking about a $500 billion to $1 trillion infrastructure replacement um, area that, that we're hoping to address with this program. Um, let's talk a little bit about the program. On the next slide, there's, uh, there's really four, you know, stakeholder groups here. So uh, if we look over at the uh, kind of the purple box in the, the lower right-hand corner, they're, they're the people who are actually going to develop the tools. So these would be the codings, the robots to deposit the codings, the integrity inspection tools to validate that those those codings will will be uh, fit for purpose, and also the people who are going to do the, the the mapping and create the data management tools. But in order for those people to get to work, we first have to tell them what performance standards they need to meet. And if you think of that problem in in reverse, what we typically do is we ask how can we break the pipe? What are the failure mechanisms? And defining the failure mechanisms and the testing procedures and the modeling for those tests and then the extrapolations to get life, that task falls to UC Boulder, who's working with Cornell. The researchers there work with the, uh, the uh, CIPP liner folks, and the Gas Technology Institute is also a partner in that effort. Um, informing that UC Boulder group with the actual specifications is the group where NARUC's participation is absolutely critical. This is the testing and technical specification panel. This is a committee that is comprised of the regulators, uh, government agencies, uh, codes and standards people, we'll talk about it more, but you are the people who know when it's quote unquote good enough. And we need your input into the testing and performance specifications to, so that the UC Boulder folks can then tell the system component developers what they need to be aiming for in terms of performance targets. If we don't get good closure from the TTSP, then the system component developers will essentially be wandering in the wilderness and the probability of success is very low. So we need your participation and I'll emphasize that point again. The last the last group to talk about here is the actual people who in the future will be doing this work. This is the service companies. And part of the RPE program outreach was to flange up the system component developers with service companies so we have a path to market, so we have the entire loop covered. So that's kind of a quick overview of the stakeholders of the program. Um, in the next slide, we can talk about the uh, some of the specific activities. And I'm gonna start with this technical and testing specification panel, because if you, if you walk away with nothing else, I want you to remember that we need your help here. The TTSP meeting, it says it's gonna be kicked off the first week of September. We had to delay that. It's now gonna be the first week of October. And it's the key repair stakeholders who do not have a commercial interest in the outcome of the program. I want to emphasize no vendors are allowed. So that's regulators. It's DOT FEMSA. We've got uh, um, Charles Wallace from NAPS are involved. But when I say regulators, I think we have about six PUCs who are already volunteered. We would like to get as broad a participation as possible. It includes the utilities because they are the absolute gatekeepers on what's going to be acceptable for their systems codes and standards organizations, because at the end of the day, FEMSA refers back to the codes and standards organizations for their specifications. And we're working very closely with other government agencies. Chris Creatus, who I, I believe is on this call, has been cooperating with us extremely closely. Um, and, and, you know, I, again, I, I congratulate, you know, him and, and Nehru keeping this, uh, this close cooperation. Uh, we're working not only with DOT FEMSA, but with the Federal Highway Safety Administration, it turns out they also have an underground mapping program, and we're looking at how we can coordinate our program with their program to develop synergies. And likewise, the uh, California Energy Commission has awarded several million dollars in programs for pipeline mapping. So we're trying to work with various agencies to develop synergies between our programs 
so that we're not duplicating work. And in fact, we, we believe we, there's a lot of opportunities to do a one plus one equals uh, three kind of thing here. Um, we'll have quarterly meetings. And again, we need your participation. And, and just so you know, OTD is gonna be facilitating the meetings. That's how we're bringing the utility players in. So the next slide, I think, uh, kind of uh, says it all. We need you. The last thing I, I have to, I can't say it enough. The last thing we want to do is spend three years and $38 million and find out that there was a question on day one that we should have been aware of. In order for this technology to get commercialized, we need to have alignment and your voices are key. So here's my contact information. Um, feel free to let us know. Um, and we'll, we'll get you on the list for the meeting. Uh, and get and we, we very much need your participation. I'm just going to briefly go through uh, some of the details of the program here. There were actually uh, three categories of work testing, which I mentioned is uh, you see older people are, are have the lead on it with GTI and Cornell helping, and also a group out of uh, Australia who were the ones who really highlighted the fact that you could do these internal repairs on pipe um, for whatever it's worth. Their focus has been on high pressure oil and gas lines. And when they showed it could work for those high pressure systems, we figured there's a lot of promise for, for making it work for our distribution uh, systems. So they're going to be responsible for the failure test, which the TTSP needs to approve, um, looking at the codes and standards issues. And then what ultimately we want to do is upgrade the models with the latest Bayesian statistics. This is coming out of GTI so that we can we can have confidence in the in the life predictions. Then we have several teams, and you'll be hearing from three of them, who are working on the integrated coding, deposition, and integrity inspection tools. This is the actual guts of the repair. Um, and again, these uh, these pipes will be lined from the inside, and our end goal is to actually be able to do this while the pipes are live. And finally, there's a mapping exercise, and there's two approaches. One is to put tools inside the pipe, to map from inside the pipe. Interestingly, DARP is already doing this for caves, and so we're trying to work with some of the same people who are developing these tools for DARPA to apply them to pipes. Our, our situation's a little less critical than an Al-Qaeda cave mapping exercise, but nonetheless equally important. And then we have a surface tool uh, that was developed to detect unexploded ordnance which can be directly applied to pipes and allow us to develop 3D maps of pipes. Um, the next slide um, 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 is just to, to highlight some of the teams that are working on this. I've mentioned them, and you're gonna be hearing from General Electric and Autonomic uh, in the next, next set of presentations, um, and also ULC, a, uh, a New York uh, company, uh, and I'll let uh, Farrah describe their organization. And again, the mapping is coming from White Rivers and Carnegie Mellon, who's been working closely with DARPA. I apologize, I believe the next slide is a duplicate. We can skip that one um, and uh, go on to the next slide. And I'd like to open it up for questions. I realize I'm giving you a chance to sip from a fire hose here and dropping a lot of information, but very interested in getting your feedback on the program. And again, very much need to solicit your participation in the TTSP. Um, questions? Jack, this is Julie. Uh, I have a question. I'll get it started. Sometimes the first question is hard to ask. Um, you mentioned that the costs look like they're um, more affordable than excavating, but could you provide any sort of information there in, in terms of assurances that they are or what you're seeing in the cost comparison to the traditional approach for these repairing these pipes? Yeah, so we, we kind of took this from both angles. The, uh, the first thing we did when we, when we issued the request for proposals for the repair program, we put together a spreadsheet that identified the costs, including the cost for shutting down the gas lines um, if, if the repairs had to be do, done offline. And so we wanted to track what is the cost of the coating material itself, because if, if the coating material is too expensive, you can't possibly meet the million dollar a mile criteria. And then we looked at what would be the, uh, the cost of labor as well as the amortized cost of the equipment. And we, re we required all of the applicants to submit an initial cost sheet 
because we wanted them to be focusing on these cost issues and to make sure that they were cognizant of how much money they have in their budget to hit a million dollar a mile. During the course of the program, we will be tracking the results against those financial metrics. That's gonna be an important part for all of the performers to quarterly update their, their spreadsheet on what their projected costs are. Um, and a big part of that cost at the end of the day will depend on the capital utilization, which is again why it's so important to make sure that we have NARUC members and the utilities on board with this. The companies are gonna to have to spend millions of dollars in first cost for hardware and if they're only getting a five or 10% capital utilization of that hardware, it's gonna drive the per mile cost through the roof. So it's really important, this program really works when everybody is in agreement that this technology is ready, it's safe, and it can be deployed so that the, the companies who are investing in commercializing this technology know that there's actually a market out there. So it's a good question. I hope I, I, hope I answered, answered your question. Yeah, I think you did. And um, from a regulatory standpoint, that's always one of the biggest ones. You know, it's hard to justify um, taking a new technology that's no more expensive unless it provides a whole bunch of other benefits, which it sounds like yours does. So if um, if these projects come in on budget, com, com, you know, parallel to what the existing technology and and regime requires and costs, I think that they should be looked upon pretty favorably, at least initially from commissioners. What else? Uh, maybe one other comment there. We uh, we did a uh, maybe not a, a, an extremely extensive survey, but we we did query uh, the Northeast utilities who have a, a lot of pipeline replacement programs. I know my former utility that I worked for completed their pipeline replacement. So we were looking for benchmarks and um, the numbers that we're seeing from urban areas range from about three to um, in, in the worst cases, about $10 million a mile. So, you know, our million dollar a mile puts us at roughly break even with uh, replacement costs in, I'll call it more rural uh, type areas. Um, when we talk to the folks, for example, in, uh, in areas like West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania, they they could see replacement costs in the million dollars a mile. However, we can bring advantages, you know, in terms of, you know, functionality that they don't have. There's still a value proposition. But I think in the urban areas, that's where this technology is really going to um, offer some substantial savings to the to the ratepayers. Thank you. Dr. Leonard, um, this is Commissioner Kim Rob. Did you say that you're targeting 60,000 miles of pipeline that's out there? Well, there's 60,000 miles of legacy bare steel and cast iron pipes. The best count we have right now is there's probably about 2,000 miles in roughly the, call it 10 inch and above for the cast iron pipe. It's a little bit harder to get the numbers of uh, uh, diameter miles for the bare steel, but it's probably about a comparable number. So our initial market will be those larger diameter pipes. Um, there's there's uh, some mixed uh, uh, thoughts, I think, on what to do with some of the smaller bore pipe. In some cases, we've talked to some commissions and they feel like, say, the smaller pipe, six inches or below cast iron, should be replaced. They're not really interested in a, uh, in a rehabilitation program. There's other utilities uh, who have even two inch diameter pipe that would be extremely expensive to replace. And they've asked us, do we believe that ultimately these technologies can be miniaturized to address their needs? So I wanna emphasize, we're, we're looking at that 10 inch and above to start, but most likely we can address smaller bore if the commissions and the utilities think that there's a value proposition in, in rehabilitating those lines. Okay, thank you. I want to be respectful of time for my co-presenters here, so I know I'm getting a little bit close to the end of my time. If um, happy to answer another question, or also happy to cede the floor to the uh, to the actual performers under the repair program. 
Jack, this is Diane Berman. Could you just go over a little bit on the next timeline um, for engaging with your, the stakeholders? Yeah, so the TTSP meeting, I believe, is October 6th, starting at uh, um, 1 o'clock Central Time. Mike Adamo from, uh, from uh, uh, OTD is facilitating that meeting. Uh, and we would, again, we're going to have the agenda out probably beginning of next week. It's an organizational meeting, but we, we have um, some pretty immediate needs. We've identified about nine failure mechanisms that we think are relevant for this pipe and pipe repair. And we need to get buy-in from the TTSP that we're, we're adequately describing the failure mechanisms because those in turn translate into the performance specifications. Um, the, the teams will be kicking off their work as soon as they get under contract. And most of them are under a, uh, a uh, 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 provisional award already. So we're looking forward to getting the teams kicked off uh, next month. And uh, at that point, we'll be meeting quarterly with the teams and the TTSP, and we can have regular feedback to, back to, uh, to NARU, uh, you know, whatever, whatever communication mechanism you see is fit. Great. Thank you so much. I think it's really a, a critical program, and I really like that you are trying to bring all stakeholders together so that on the front end you work through um, any challenges. Thank you. Well, and again, thanks for the opportunity to present. And again, I want to be mindful of uh, my co-speakers co here, so perhaps it's time to turn the floor over to them. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Leonard, for the great presentation. We look forward to working with you and learning more. Uh, so next up, uh, we have Dr. Todd Danko, who's the principal roboticist at GE Global Research. Uh, there he focuses on building robotic systems to perform inspection and maintenance ta tasks from the inside of industrial equipment, such as gas turbines, aircraft engines and pipe networks, reducing the need for equipment disassembly uh, prior to joining GE. Uh, Dr. Danko worked at Lockheed Martin's Advanced Technology Labs. Um, Dr. Danko earned his PhD in mechanical engineering from Drexel University, where he investigated aerial manipulation mechanisms and control approaches. Uh, we also have Dr. Farah Singer, who is an associate project manager at ULC Robotics, uh, where she manages government R&D projects and works on developing new proposals and business opportunities. Before joining ULC in 2020, Dr. Singer worked as a research associate at the Center for Environmental Energy Engineering at the University of Maryland. Dr. Singer received her PhD in engineering sciences from the University of Poitiers in France in 2015 and our master's degree in physics from the Lebanese National University in 2011. Uh, finally, Dr. Gerald Wilson is president and CEO of Autonomic Materials. Um, during his tenure at AMI, Dr. Wilson has led the development, scale up and commercial introduction of the company's AMPAR MORTM product line, including support of a new product launch by a top 10 coatings brand, as well as the development of the company's new low VLC protective coating product line. Um, line. Uh, Dr. Wilson earned a BA in chemistry from McAllister College, a PhD in material science and engineering, and an MBA from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Welcome, everyone. Okay, well, hi everybody. My name is Todd Danko and I can, um, I guess, get things started here. Um, so I am representing um, a project that is is funded uh, uh, under the ARPA-E repair program that we're, we're getting ready to kick off in the next month or so. Um, this project is called the Pipeline Underground Trenchless Overhaul System, or Pluto for short. Um, so, Effectively, we're developing a robotic system um, as well as materials and inspection technologies 
uh, to support the goals that Dr. Leonard just described. Uh, the team consists of GE Research, uh, which is where I'm from, where we focus primarily on uh, the robotics and the inspection technologies, Warren Environmental, which is developing the structural uh, coding materials, and Garver, who is helping advise the team on industri industry practices and customer and regulatory acceptance. Okay. Um, here we have uh, the goals, approach, and technology impacts that we expect to come out of this program. Uh, so at a very high level, our goal is to create a full system that can perform minimally invasive structural pipeline rehabilitation that will result in a effectively a new pipe within an existing uh, deteriorating pipe. And that the goal is for that lining to be as good or better than what you would have if you directly replaced the pipe uh, through excavation techniques. Uh, we hope that our approaches will lead to a more economical infrastructure maintenance than what is currently available through excavation. Um, by rehabilitating these existing pipe, uh, uh, pipes through sparse access points, we anticipate a dramatic cost reduction. Um, and we also expect that um, this cost reduction is gonna be highly variable depending on the things like the, the geography of where the pipe is laid out and the specific configuration for some pipes. So um, somewhere around one-tenth of the cost of excavation approaches is what we are we're striving for. Um, our approach includes uh, providing a system that obtains access and that's the robotic crawler system. Um, another subsystem that prepares the pipe for maintenance. So this cleans the internal surfaces, making it so the uh, any coatings we apply to them will stick the way they're designed um, or slip in some cases the way they're designed um, as well as the creation and process for the deposition of structural materials uh, to form these internal pipes within the existing pipes um, we expect that uh, an inspection will be performed before the lining uh, to ensure that a given pipeline is a suitable candidate for a process and also after the lining is is completed to ensure that the rehabilitation was performed appropriately. Um, from a technical impact perspective, um, which will contribute to the economics of such a system, uh, the Pluto system will have a range of up to 1,000 meters up or downstream from the insertion point, and that helps reduce the number of excavations that are required to perform this type of rehabilitation. Um, because of that long range and the ability for us to both uh, clean, deploy patch uh, coating materials and perform inspections fairly quickly with our robotic systems, uh, we have a goal of achieving all of those steps for 1,000 meters of pipe in a 36 hour window. And that's definitely a number that we have to work hard to achieve, but we do have a plan to get there. Uh, the materials that we are developing are derived from the water and wastewater industries and have a proven track record in those domains, which uh, we are working to extend for the gas distribution pipeline areas, where we anticipate the longevity of a rehabilitated pipe to be as good or better than what's expected by full pipeline replacement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's a timeline uh, to achieve our ultimate vision of a commercially viable pipe rehabilitation system. Um, so this effort, um, we are um, you know, going to be kicking off a ARPA-E funded program uh, fairly soon. Uh, and that's, that's really viewed as the beginning. Um, but you know, what we have are a collection of some technologies that are at various degrees of maturity. Um, but effectively, none of them have really been um, established to work exactly how we want them uh, in the gas pipeline environment. So the first steps uh, that we'll be spending the first couple of years um, of this project on are to extend those technologies um, and you know, test and iterate as we go to ensure that we can bring them together to create an integrated demonstration for ARPA-E and other stakeholders. Um, but we view that as really just the beginning of the story here. Um, once we get to that stage, uh, we have a plan where we are going to both um, extend the application domains um, when appropriate. We don't necessarily think that we're going to have a, a magic system that can work absolutely everywhere. Um, but if it looks promising, we're going to extend into water, wastewater, 
nuclear, petroleum, and industrial site infrastructure with the technologies that we're developing, um, really being kickstarted by the, the ARPA-E funding. Um, and then through some additional uh, maturation efforts, our goal is to have a fully commercialized uh, pipe rehabilitation system. And that's something that is going to be um, a, a bit of a longer term plan for us, um, but hopefully it'll be worth, worth the wait. In the next slide, please. So finally, I want to at least mention some challenges that we are facing in this effort. So first, uh, this is a new approach to pipeline maintenance that we were discussing, and it will be valueless, as Dr. Leonard had uh, pointed out before, um, if the people who own the pipelines and the regulators who uh, hold some responsibility for their safe use don't trust it to be used on their systems. Um, and so it's very important, as uh, Dr. Leonard mentioned, to work very closely with those stakeholders as we move forward. And that's true for the gas pipeline industry, but also for these other um, application domains that we may find uh, this technology relevant to as we move forward. Um, the second major risk, or it's actually a collection of risks, risks is that we, um, that we face is related to performance. Uh, we're preparing to build a system of systems which uh, each component has not yet really been proven to not only work in the environment that we wanted to work in, but even work with each other. Um, so we're developing new materials and we need to make sure that we have inspection technologies that are complementary to those materials and access systems that can ensure that we can safely and effectively deploy these materials where they need to go. And that's, um, Know, safety for the workers, but also an environmental safety uh, factor that we have to consider for these systems. So we're going to be working through uh, development and test cycles over the, uh, the coming years to build the simplest possible system that achieves the technical development goals that we're, we're setting out to achieve. And that is um, an economical mechanism for rehabilitating pipe networks. Um, we think it's going to be worth it over the long term, and I think we're going to hold any questions that come up to the end of uh, the rest of the, the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Singer, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioners, and thank you, Dr. Leonard, for this opportunity. We're very excited to be presenting today our cold spray technology for rehabilitating natural gas uh, pipelines. Our project is led by ULC. As Dr. Jack mentioned, we are based in New York. Uh, ULC is a company that focuses on uh, R&D and uh, providing uh, robotics for services in many areas, including natural gas, water, sewer pipelines, electricity distribution transmission, and in addition to solar and wind as well. In the next slide, I'd like to start with defining the objectives of uh, our project because this will help us define better the innovation. So uh, we are aiming to create uh, stainless steel coating, structural uh, coatings inside an aging pipe without uh, relying on uh, the strengths of the aging pipe. Uh, we want to take advantage of all the, the superior um, um, properties of stainless steel like uh, corrosion resistance in addition to also meeting the uh, long life expectancy. As you can see on the schematic, uh, simply, simplified schematic on the right, we are uh, hoping to create a system that can have a nozzle inside of the pipe, the aging pipe, that can create these uh, structural coatings that I mentioned. To do so, we have to develop a system that uh, that relies or um, that uses the coal spray atom manufacturing technique, which is a, a well-established technique for many years now. It's been used for repairs and many other applications, but not for rehabilitating pipelines. So in our project, we'll be developing this process so that we can uh, reach uh, our goal, as you can see here. Uh, in the next slide, um, I'll be explaining that uh, the innovation behind this project and the objectives uh, would lead us to a very uh, a positive impact uh, on the nation. And we are targeting by this impact uh, the market as our technology would be deployed for uh, different pipelines. And at the same time, it will be a cost-effective uh, process or 
a technology where we are targeting uh, an end cost of less than $1 million per mile, in addition to the fact that we will need minimal excavation for this technology, and that's why our cost will be driven low. Uh, we are showing here on the right an example of uh, one of ULC technologies that also required very minimal ex excavation, so this is something we know we can uh, achieve. Uh, other impacts for uh, for this technology would be on the environmental level, where uh, employing or deploying this technology inside the aging pipe will not require pre-cleaning the pipe, and that, this is why we're eliminating the need for disposing hazardous uh, waste as well, in addition to one important uh, impact for us, which is not disrupting the service. So our technology, our process will be uh, used inside a live natural uh, gas pipeline. To do so, we are we have partnered with national leads in cold spray technologies, such as uh, Dr. Timothy Eden's team at Pennsylvania State University, who will be helping us in developing the process parameters for uh, this system. And uh, we are we teamed up also with uh, uh, Brookhaven National Labs and Dr. Alessandra Colley's team, who is also a national lead in material characterization, who will help us test and verify uh, the superior uh, properties of the coding. And at ULC, as a lead, we will be leading the, uh, the, the system design, fabrication, and uh, the test bench, all uh, through our uh, experience. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I'll be uh, uh, talking about the challenges. And to better understand the challenges that we might face in our project, we have to go back a little bit to the basic concept of the cold spray technology. As I mentioned, it's in the 3D printing and a manufacturing technique that has been established for many years now. As you can see on the right, it has been used for uh, repairs mainly, for corrosion resistance applications in the basic sense. Uh, in this technology, gases such as uh, helium or nitrogen are heated up and pressurized to accelerate uh, to accelerate a stream of uh, metallic powders that will be deposited uh, on a substrate. So in our case, we will be uh, we are hoping to use methane as the carrier gas. This is one of the major innovation in our uh, technology. And one uh, aspect that will allow us to run this process inside the live natural gas without the need to disrupt it. So we'll be using the same gas that is uh, flowing inside uh, the pipe. At the same time, uh, we will be scaling uh, down this technology to, uh, for, to adapt to the dimensions we're targeting. And uh, we, are, we will be also uh, working on optimizing the process parameters to reach all the properties for, uh, for uh, the coded, uh, for the stainless steel coding and one important challenge that we will overcome and we have a plan to handle it is the end cost and the target cost traditionally uh, in 3d printing and manufacturing the feedstock price and uh, the process speed or the printing time uh, are the major factors affecting the end cost of the technology this is why in our case we will at least start with uh, optimizing the process to achieve the higher speed, uh, speed possible and meeting our uh, target Having said that, we, do, we don't see any uh, showstoppers for our technology. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, we have gathered a team of experts in the different aspects of this technology, and we, are, um, we will be targeting meeting all the objectives uh, listed in this timeline. In the first year of this project, uh, we will be developing the process, as I explained uh, in the previous slides, to rehabilitate uh, natural gas pipelines, and we will reach out to the market and different industry players so that we could identify uh, the market requirements and define uh, commercialization roadmaps for our technology whenever it's uh, definitely mature enough. In the following a couple of years, we are looking into adapting our process into a robotic application, into a robotic system, uh, and um, uh, also maybe upgrading uh, some aspects of it, for example, like including a monitoring tool or a system uh, in the coding uh, itself, in addition to following up on all the recommendations of the TTSP, uh, the panel that Dr. Jack mentioned, uh, so that we would uh, facilitate ad the, ad the adoption of our technology eventually following these recommendations. Uh, we anticipate after that, hopefully uh, around three years of R&D, where our system can be uh, can be developed enough to be uh, to be field tested as a, as a robotic system, as a robotic uh, prototype. And at this point, we will target uh, other markets and other pipelines, such as the crude oil, petroleum, and uh, steam distribution pipes. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, I did definitely, I didn't go through all the details of the project due to the time uh, restrictions, but please uh, feel free to go over the details again and to reach out to me at any time during the course of the project. We would be very happy to uh, receive your questions or comments. And thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Uh, Dr. Wilson, please. All right. Thank you uh, again, Commissioner, for, for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leonard, for including us in this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Gerald Wilson, CEO of Autonomic Materials. And Autonomic Materials develops and commercializes uh, smart coding additives that uh, are designed to impart self-healing and stealth healing functionality into, into um, coding materials. So it, it, Autonomic Materials is, is leading uh, our team um, in, in this project. And as you've heard through uh, some of the discussion already, I think it's, it's pretty clear what some of the central goals of this project are. Uh, and so when we looked at the, the, the central goals, you know, starting with the need for um, having a structurally independent pipe that is an important um, an important criteria in in being able to actually recognize the the new infrastructure uh, as new and therefore allowable in the rate base. Um, the the fact that we needed to minimize excavation and bring the cost below a million dollars per mile, and having the fifty year life um, of the of the new pipe material required putting together a team of experts um, from, from various backgrounds. So we started off by thinking about, you know, what the new pipe material needed to be. And so we uh, added the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, to the team, working with the new material that they've uh, developed um, based on polydimethyl, uh, uh, poly, poly DCPD for short, di, uh, cyclopentadiene that as I'll show you in, in an example in, in, in one of the coming slides, has the property to go from being a gel-like material that could be extruded within a pipe to a solid, uh, tough material with properties that exceed those of typical epo polymerized epoxies and certainly uh, HDPE that are used in pipe materials today. So that really allows us to be able to, to actually um, rehabilitate existing legacy pipes with a new material that is completely structurally independent of the existing pipe. Then we added uh, Carnegie Mellon University to the team uh, in order to have the capability to do so uh, with minimal excavation. So Carnegie, the Carnegie Mellon team, uh, we're working with them to design a, 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 a set of robotic tools that will facilitate uh, extrusion of the new pipe within the existing uh, legacy pipe material. And starting with the poly DCPD material, we do have a material that uh, at the outset is going to be capable of meeting this 50 year life requirement. But in the event that in, in a particular application, um, the, the structural integrity of the material is compromised in the form of cracks, for example, that could propagate through the material. We're imparting self-healing functionality, um, which will allow the ability to arrest that crack propagation and prevent it from propagating any further, and self-reporting uh, functionality that allows us to be able to identify where that damage has occurred and use the identification of that damage to assess um, the, uh, the the health of the pipe uh, over time. And that is what autonomic materials brings to the team. And as you can see at the bottom there, you have a ruptured microcapsule, and that is the vehicle by which we're delivering the healing agents that afford the self-healing functionality, as well as the, the reporting agents that afford the self-reporting functionality. So going to the next slide, um, I just want to dig in a little bit and just give you a flavor for how the solution will actually work. So our, our plan includes um, a modular robotic platform with sensor payloads that would facilitate the ability to assess the pipe condition prior to rehabilitation to determine 
whether it is in fact a candidate for this particular rehabilitation method. Um, and that platform is also capable of pulling along a deposition tool that extrudes out and then cures uh, the new pipe material. And at the end of that process, shortly after that, because as, you, as you'll see in a second, the curing happens so quickly, uh, there's a post inspection that assesses the, the mechanical integrity of the new pipe material that follows at the end. Uh, the extruded material, as I've mentioned, rapidly converts from a gel to a structurally independent material in, the matter of, in a matter of seconds. So the pipe really is only acting as a mold uh, uh, for, um, uh, for this new material. And as I have alluded to, the new pipe will have the capability of identifying where new cracks are occurring. You can see probably at the bottom left of your screen there, um, an example of, of an image showing um, uh, damage in a material um, that is made visible by uh, the application of UV light. Um, and then on the right of that, you can see an example of, uh, of the self-healing functionality in action um, healing a, a scratch that's been put into, into a coating. Um, so the combination of the, the robotic platform, the self-reporting capability, will also allow for ongoing inspection um, of the pipe following deployment that would allow um, the identification of damage at the very, very early onset, um, as low as a few microns of damage in the material, which would allow us to effectively model the lifetime of the material. And so been talking a lot about this ability to, um, to deploy a material that is independent of a pipe and the transition from a gel material that's, that, that can be extruded to one that can be, uh, that, that is cured and is structurally independent. So there's an image there you can see on your screen uh, that shows you this material in action. And yeah, if you click the link, uh, I have a video here that kind of um, demonstrates how this will, uh, this will actually work. So this is a standard nozzle that is actually printing a helical pattern of this poly DCPD material. And you'll note that as it, as it prints it, it's actually curing as it goes and it's becoming structurally independent as that material is, is being deployed. Now, poly DCPD is known to be one of the toughest polymeric materials out there. It's used in some uh, uh, armor type applications as well. So we're gonna end up with material that can go from this gel-like rheological properties to a fully cured uh, high strength material in a matter of time with good mechanical properties as well. Um, so going back uh, to, to the deck now, um, I'll just go to the next slide and just summarize some of some of the some of the key features associated what, with what we'll be doing. We will, based on the rehabilitation method that we're using, um, be targeting that one million dollar per mile cost, uh, being substantially below that. Um, you know, if, if, if things go the way we've we've designed them, um, and when we look at the highest end of that range of what those cost today we're looking at as much as a 94% decrease in the cost relative to the installation of a new pipe. As I've shown you, the extruded pipe will be structurally independent from the host pipe. Um, and we have poly DCPD that will exhibit properties that are substantially better than incumbent polymeric pipe materials, such as HDPE and such as those that are used in CIPP type applications. Um, we expect this project to, to go for, uh, for about three years and uh, we will uh, very quickly, uh, following around Q4 of 2023, expect to begin to transition into field deployment and field testing of the solution that we've developed. So in the interest of time, I'm going to just wrap it up there and, um, and, uh, and hopefully we still have some, uh, some time for some questions. Thank you. Commissioner Fedora, what, do you have any questions? Or? Well, I have so many questions, <laughs> not a lot of time. I you mean, guys are great. <laughs> it's impressive. It's a, amazing technology that's really going to transform 
um, the pipeline industry in all kinds of arenas. I can I'm just imagine. I'm, I'm thinking of several projects that are so controversial and if you could just replace the existing pipe in the ground, what a difference that would make. So hats off to you guys for all of your hard work and um, exploration of this subject area. Um, I'm curious on some of the coatings. How do you test, uh, if we have time for a couple questions, how do you test the longevity of them? Uh, they're, they're new, how, you know, enough to be able to say you can in, in, insert this into these pipes and have it last for 20 years or 30 years or whatever um, the expectat life expectation is. Um, maybe this is Jack. I can jump in. So the, uh, you know, FEMSA has uh, uh, processes to certify polyethylene and steel pipes. And uh, when the CIPP, the cure in place liners, came onto the market, there were extensions uh, building off of those tests to qualify the CIPP technologies. One of the tasks of the TTSP is going to be to work with the experts um, in this area to define exactly what kind of test we want. Basically, uh, what you do is go through accelerated torture tests to, to assess the longevity of the material. So for example, we envision putting these things through vibrational modes that would uh, run about a million vibrations to simulate a pipe build in, built underneath, say, a railroad crossing. And it's there's a series of these tests, uh, nine that we've identified so far, that will help us to assess the life uh, through accelerated testing. But it, it is based on the known test procedures and extensions of those to this new, call it geometry, where you have a pipe in a pipe. Jack, I have a quick question. I think it's for you, Bo. It may also be to the other um, panelists. Um, th are these all standalone projects, not just these, but the other ones as well? Or is there some thought that perhaps some of these can be um, combined into one commercial product. product or are we looking at any of the, that? Um, well, so RPE funds the teams, but it's up to the teams to decide how they want to commercialize their technology. So for right. example, we have two teams that are working on um, fiber reinforced polymeric materials, two teams um, that are working on uh, polymeric materials valve fibers, uh, a cold spray team um, and a, a hot sintered metal team. Um, we would we would have so long as somebody wants to bring something to the market, RPE would be fine with that. Uh, I think what you see though, are in some sense, are you know part of what we're trying to do is create a competitive atmosphere here. So I think each one of these teams, uh, if you asked who's going to win the race, they would uh, be the first to raise their hands. Um, but but yes, as far as commercializing, we, we definitely would do whatever we could to facilitate, you know, combining teams if that's what makes sense to get the products into the market. And it's consistent with the team's commercial objectives. Great. Thank you for the uh, answer. I have just a quick question. What's the speed at which you can rehabilitate a, a mile of a pipeline, for instance? Can you guesstimate as to that? Um, I'll uh, guess let each of the teams each of the teams can offer their their uh, their target speeds if they want. Maybe nobody wants to go first, so they're not bested by the next person. That's okay. That's okay. I understand it's a competition. Yeah, this is Todd. No. Um, um, so, so we're sorry, anticipating um, uh, 36 hours for 1,000 meters of pipe. Um, that is ambitious, and it will take some time to get there. Uh, so you can convert that into miles if you'd like. That's 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 impressive. I just know with people's gas and how much they're spending per year, and to increase um, the speed um, to accelerate the program from from 10 to 20 years is the cost and what have you. So yeah, this is great stuff. This is very fascinating. It's very you all are very impressive. Very. Thank you very much.
So with that, um, it looks like we might be done with the webinar. Thank you, everybody. That was great. Appreciate everyone taking time today. Yeah, special Thank you very much. to the yeah. Department of Energy as well, and and all of you great panelists. Thanks so much. I, I look forward to to speaking with you all and learning more. This is great stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, we Thank you again. Thank you very much.